Hey, good morning, friends. I'm meteorologist John Aaron's. It is 1030 in the morning on a Wednesday. Hope you are doing OK and you're staying hopeful in these uh, difficult moments that we have now, usually around this time in the morning. I'm usually out around out and about schools talking about science, talking about meteorology. Go to all across Charlotte, up and through Salisbury, Statesville, up and through Morganton, Rock Hill, been down to Chester, uh, talking about science and talking about how it is just so much fun and fun to learn this and to talk to the kids and see where they're at and see some of their uh, questions that they may have because science, of course, is extremely complex, but I like to get kids interested in it. Of course, right now, uh, with all of us kind of hunkered down, we don't have that opportunity. So let's take advantage of this through Facebook Live and take you through a science lesson, kids. I know a lot of you are trying to learn from home right now and via computer, so we will learn some science this morning. Now, while we're talking, and when I get going here, uh, I can answer questions through the phone here because this is all interactive. So I want to say a quick shout out to Christina and uh, Heather Baum and Matthew Vincent from Indian Trail. Thank you so much for tuning in. Stacy Butera and all the kids, of course, out watching. We'll talk. Feel free to send me some questions. But first, let's talk about how and some of the complexities behind science. And before we do that, I always like to tell kids the first thing to remember and it all comes to science is don't get intimidated, okay? Don't be scared because science uses a lot of big, fancy words, words that drive me crazy. I always try to tell people, you know, when you go on to do a test, you know, I, I didn't always take tests that well when I was a kid, and you see some of these big words and you get all scared and then you mess up the test, right? Don't worry about it, okay? I always think that those words are meant to scare people. Don't let it scare you. I always take the word, for example, meteorologist. That word really drives me crazy. And I'm sealed by the American Meteorological Society. I have what's called the Certified Broadcast Meteorology Seal. But the word meteorology, what does that mean? I chase storms all the time. I've never chased a meteor in my life. And if I saw a meteor, I would probably run. Why in the world would they use a word like meteorologist? I'll tell you a little bit of trivia. It comes from the root word hydrometeor. Now what in the world does that mean? A hydrometeor? These big fancy words? All a hydrometeor is, guys, is a raindrop. It's a raindrop, okay? Don't be scared by the big words. Meteorologist, fine. Okay, that's fine. But that's a raindrop. What I study, the thing that I'm most passionate about, really, is air. It's all about air, kids. Remember this, okay? When you guys are trying to study and focus on, st on science, a lot of the things that we talk about are things that you can't see. And that's kind of hard to wrap your head around, right? But those are the big things. It's things that you cannot see. Believe it or not, the human eyes are designed to only see a very small part of what's going on in the big world. We're all talking about a virus, right? Where you can't see that virus. You can't always trust these things, friends. Think about it. Think of like microwaves. Think about when you're popping popcorn in the microwave. Can you see that microwave energy pouring through that bag, heating up the popcorn? Of course not. How many of you ever broken a bone before? Can you see the x-ray taking a picture of your bone? You can't. Your eyes will fall off. There are certain things that the human eye cannot see. So don't always trust them. So what we're talking about is something that you have to have imaginations almost for, guys. I know we're talking to some people who are maybe six, seven years old, and you guys got a great imagination. But maybe I'm talking to guys who are like, you know, 10, 11, 12, maybe you've lost a little bit of your imagination. Don't do that. There are so many things that these guys, these eyes cannot see. And the world that we're dealing with in the world of meteorology, science, and weather is based on that. It's all about air. The air that you're breathing right now. Everybody take a deep breath for me. I'm a yoga guy, okay? I'm, a, I'm big into yoga. People always make fun of me. Uh, you know, back behind the set, and we'll show you a little bit of the set here in just a little bit. But uh, I have a yoga mat behind me in the studio. So usually what I'm doing, you know, while news is going on, is that, you know, I'm sometimes doing 
poses. I hope my boss isn't listening, but that, that's, that's what I do sometimes. I'm all about yoga, so everybody take a deep breath for me, okay? It's all about air. That's it. It's all about air. I don't care if you're talking about hurricanes, which I've been through many. Don't care about tornadoes, which I've been through. Ice storms, hail, whatever. It's all about the air. We study air here. And air has different properties. Believe it or not, the air has a weight to it. Can you imagine that? Imagine, just close your eyes, imagine if you could take the air around you and put it on a scale. Let's say that this table is a scale and you were able to take the air and put it on a scale. We can weigh that and we use a fancy word for that. That's called barometric pressure. Big fancy word. Don't mess it up on a test. All it means is weight. How many times do you go to the bathroom and you step on a scale and you go, ah! Air's the same thing. You have heavy air, you have air that's light. You have air that you know, has eaten you know, 100 cupcakes. You have air that hasn't eaten in three weeks. Same deal, same concept. The air that is heavy, the air that weighs a lot, the air that has an eating problem, maybe eats too many Doritos, that's called high pressure. It's big, it's expansive, and usually it's very clear. So we have that right now going on across the eastern part of our country. We would put an H right here, right? And we would push everything out because that air weighs so much and it's so expansive, okay? Can you imagine that, all right? Just this big, very heavy set piece of air, put it on a scale, it would weigh a lot, right? Now, the opposite, just imagine, and again, you can't see this, guys, can't see it. What if there was something that didn't need as much? Didn't do a whole lot. Didn't weigh very much. Very small. That's low pressure, okay? We actually have one on the board and it's kind of located right now up in the northern part of Missouri. Now what the air, what our planet wants to do, what our planet wants to do is have everything equal, okay? They don't want this guy to keep eating so much. They want this guy to eat a little more. The planet, back to yoga, wants balance, right? That's what the planet wants, balance. But it can never happen. You can't get that, ever. But the planet tries. If you had it, we would probably not be here. But the planet tries. The Earth is trying to get that balance of pressure. So what it will do is it will send reinforcements from that big high guy, high pressure guy, and send it right into here, okay? When that happens, you get what we call a convergence. And just imagine if the air, just imagine like a, a mall, kind of picture a shopping mall, and instead of people in that mall, imagine it's air, air parcels, what we call, okay? Just imagine there's just thousands and thousands of air at this mall, and they start piling up together and piling and piling up. Well, eventually what that's going to do is that's going to start to bring clouds and build up clouds and build up that rain, okay? All that is is like a traffic jam. So the air, so the planet that's trying to have um, balance, right? Trying to have some sort of symmetry is trying to balance it out. But by doing that, it is causing all of this air to converge in one spot. And it's a traffic jam, and that's what produces heavy rains, some of the thunderstorms that we see, all right? Now let's talk about the Earth real quick. And while we're talking, let me just say, welcome to Facebook Live. Welcome to this science lesson. Thanks so much. We have a good morning to Kathy Jones from Rock Hill and Monica Faust and Elizabeth Smith that's watching in and Amanda. Thank you, Wesley Page and Sammy from Wesley Chapel. Thanks so much. I will get to your questions, guys, but let's talk a little bit more about why science is the way it is and why the planet works the way it is. And I wanna tell you something really awesome about science and how the earth works. Anna Smart's watching, thank you. Adrian, thank you very much. And Marissa Arms, thank you very much. I, I think uh, somebody's having a problem with the live stream, Marissa, we'll work on that. Okay, let's talk about earth, guys. Let's talk about the planet. Let me see if I can get that done. Uh, bear with me. I'm gonna try to do something real quick 
and show you a little bit about how the planet works. Okay, I'm just going to widen out the Earth a little bit. Can we go to Lynx 2? Okay. There's the Earth. Sorry for the bunch of numbers. But just real quickly, everybody sees the Earth standing like that. And it's a pretty little picture of the Earth. And everybody thinks in their textbooks that the Earth is just sitting, hanging out, doing nothing. Okay, we can go back to the desk. The Earth isn't doing that, friends. The Earth is working, okay? The Earth, in reality, okay, is tilted 23.5 degrees. Let me go back to yoga, and anybody who's a big yoga guy, that's almost like the half moon, kind of like this, okay? So the Earth is standing like this, and it's been doing that for billions of years, okay? That is extremely important, because the angle that the Earth is at 23.5 degrees, if it was a little farther away, like 23.5001, if it was tilted that way, we'd be too far away from the sun. We'd freeze. What if it was tilted a little bit closer? 23.4999999999. We'd be too close to the sun. We'd melt. 23.5 degrees. The Earth is tilted, friends. That is huge. That's the reason why you and I are breathing today, okay? That angle hasn't changed for billions of years. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that cool? What that will do is actually create different kinds of air. Remember? Breathe in the air, right? Air is breathing, air is moving, air is all around us, and the air has characteristics. The air has a property, right? What my job is, what Steve's job is, Keith, Tony, Jacqueline, we try to describe the air. And because the planet is tilted, you're going to have different kinds of air. The air is going to be a little colder here, warmer here. You're near the equator. A little colder here, right? Warmer here, colder here. So you have different spots where the air's colder and where it's warmer, okay? Now, that would be nothing doing unless the planet does what? The planet doesn't, doesn't sit here, does it? It rotates, right? So that rotation and the revolution around the sun causes those air masses, those pockets of air to move. That's critical. That's what causes the season, sure, winter, spring, summer, fall, sure, but it also drives the weather, okay? I'm gonna go right back here and show you why that's important. Bear with me here. We'll go back to the United States, okay? Keep it on links too if you could, okay? So, and again, wanna welcome everybody to Facebook Live. We're talking about the Earth and why its tilt is so important in what we discuss, I mean, how we live and in driving the weather machine. So thanks so much for tuning in. Julie Helms is in the house. Andy Holtz here. What's up, Andy? Chopper 9 pilot. Appreciate him for all his work. Okay, so we talked about the Earth, right? And why that tilt is so important, all right? The air around us, the different kinds of air, move all around the globe, okay? Because we're tilting or we're rotating around the sun, we're revolving, right, okay? So all those air masses are moving. Now, here's the key, guys. All you kids, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about the coolest place in school, which is what? Recess, right? Now, I want you to think about recess, and I want you to think about the playground and how there's cool stuff to do in the playground, right? Now, sometimes along the playground, there's different groups of kids that don't get along with other groups. And I'm not lying, I'm telling the truth, right? You know what I'm talking about. In the air, it's the same way. Cold air and warm air 
do not like each other one bit. They can't be in the same room together, all right? They just totally dislike each other. They never get along, okay? They argue all the time. They bicker. It's constant. So anytime when I'm at work, when Jacqueline's at work, Tony, Steve, Keith, what we're looking for is where's the cold and where's the hot? And if we find out that they're on top of the mountains or if we're on top of Charlotte, we're in trouble. That's when you get the trouble. So this temperature map is a really good example of that, okay? So you have a bunch of warm air, right, that's surging in here from the south, all right? The temperature's almost about 60 degrees, right? So that's warm air. I always like to tell the kids who've seen Moana, who's seen Moana? It's a good show. You remember Maui, all right? You know, just imagine that Maui and all his people, all right, are in control of the south. They're dominating Charlotte weather right now. That's why the temperatures later on today, and you're going to hear Steve talk about it today, and actually I'll be on at noon as well, uh, is going to surge to 80 degrees. 80 degrees. Warm, dominant. Meanwhile, our friends up in Minneapolis, up in Boston, up in Pittsburgh, it's not so much that they're living up to the north. Yeah, that's right, but this air moves. It moves. We watch those blue colors changing to green. We watch them slipping into yellow. They move, guys. So what we're doing at work right now is we're tracking that movement. So up in Pittsburgh, it's 40, 43 Boston sliding down into Charlotte. All right. If it gets anywhere close and they get in the same room, you have drama. That's what causes the drama. Can we go to links one? That's what's going on right now, friends, up across St. Louis. All it is is that cold air meeting up with that warm air. The two of those are going at it, and there is drama. That's what's happening right now. So when those two are going at each other, that causes your thunderstorms. That causes the heavy rain. And every once in a while, it can cause the tornadoes. Let's think about that, guys. Not so long ago up in Nashville, there was a massive tornado outbreak, right? Well, what's happening there is a very intense battle between cold and warm. Those two are in the room. They're arguing constantly, and it happened right on top of Tennessee. Now, every once in a while, you'll get a wind where the wind is really fast up in the upper part of the atmosphere. When that happens, that adds to your tornado threat. Picture riding a bike. What would happen if I'm riding a bike very fast down a hill, 50 miles an hour? Let's go faster, 60, 70, and all of a sudden I decide to turn. What would happen? I'd end up in the emergency room, wouldn't I? Air does the same thing. Why can't the air do the same thing? Now, the air doesn't go to the hospital, right? There's no atrium health for the air. Instead, the air, what we'll do, it can't go to urgent care, so instead it spins. Okay? It spins, and it spins, and it spins, and it spins. And that's what gets, gives life to a mesocyclone, another big fancy word, or tornado. That's all it is. When you think about that kind of stuff, just thinking about the bike moving very, very fast. That's what causes a tornado. Now, again, we want to welcome everybody. It's 1049. We're going to be talking about any kind of questions that you may have. But let's also discuss real quick about tornado season since we're getting into that point, right? Always remember, guys, to keep yourself calm. That's the big thing. Keep yourself calm because did you know that if you heard about a tornado and you start freaking out that all the nerves in your body, this is true, all the nerves and tissues in your body freeze up like this and you can't move, you can't move. You'd be no help to anybody. We couldn't move you because you're stiff as a board. Be chill, chill out, right? Make sure that you're covering, you're protecting your head and you're at the lowest level of your whatever building, okay? Just remember those things, stay away from windows, and don't be going on your phone. I got my phone here, taking selfies of a tornado. That's ridiculous, all right? Just make sure you're listening to your teachers and you got your head covered. Okay, all right, let's ask, uh, answer some questions here. We got Wesley Page coming in, and, and feel free to ask uh, anything that you guys have. Uh, 
Uh, Elizabeth Smith, for example, has been talking about tornadoes since the ones that came through that we had up in Charlotte. A absolutely, they were damaging and we're just getting started, guys. Severe weather is just getting started. And it happens because, can we go back to links too? It's the top prime battleground between warm and cold, friends. It's happening right now. Cold air and warm air don't get along. So as a scientist, and when we learn science, all we're doing is describing things. That's it. It's not complicated. We're not using big, fan, you know, worried about big fancy words like thermodynamics, okay? I just explained to you what thermodynamics is. Don't let the big words scare you. All it is is air moving around, right? And the air has a different property, has a different characteristic, right? We describe it. Well, this air's warm. Well, this air has moisture to it. Wait a minute, how, how does the air have moisture to it? I can't see air carrying anything. You know that it has moisture, don't you? Imagine, again, close your eyes and imagine the air. Imagine that it's carrying like a bucket, right? A bucket of water. Sometimes the water is small, not a lot of water in it. You felt that, haven't you, in the dead of winter? Right? When you're having to put chapstick on, right, or the lotion, very dry outside, not a lot of water in the air. You've been out on a hot summer day in the south, right, in August, a lot of water, a lot of sweating, right? Again, these are things that you cannot see. You can't see those air parcels holding all that humidity, right? But it's happening. Don't always trust these guys. Sometimes the air is holding so much water that it spills over. Can you imagine if you're carrying a big bucket of water, all right, and all of a sudden you bump into something or you hit it against the desk or something, you're carrying all this water, what's gonna happen to it? It's gonna spill over. Sometimes that air, it waves so much you can't carry that water anymore, it spills over. That's condensation. That's condensation. That's low cloud cover forming. That gets fog. Is anybody out in the fog today? Wasn't that crazy? Yeah, that's all that is. Air's holding moisture. Doesn't matter how much, or just it just kind of depends on how much it weighs. You know, how much uh, are you bumping into other guys? That kind of thing. All right. Just imagine that the air has a property to it, and it's carrying something. Okay. All right. Jenna Bergrimp is asking, is North Carolina in a tornado zone? Thanks, Karen, for that question. Um, Charlotte is not in a tornado zone. We talk about Tornado Alley, right? Tornado Alley is the central United States, okay? Places like Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, okay? And I spent a lot of time up here in North Missouri, which is right pretty much in the heart of a tornado alley. And the reason we say that is because most of the time, the cold and the warm, which don't which don't like each other, when those two get in the same place, usually it's in the middle part of the country. Thanks for that question. Hey, Amen, Christy, absolutely right. Thanks, Christy Farmer, for that question. Okay, Rebecca and Wesley Kale, uh, Cameron, who's eight years old, wants to know what causes a hailstorm. Great question. Thank you very much for that question. Who, who's that again? That was Cameron. Thanks, Cameron. Okay, how does hail form? Let's imagine that you can climb a ladder all the way up in the atmosphere, okay? Can you, can you imagine that? You're climbing that ladder. When you get higher, the air is colder, okay? Colder up there than it is here. You get to this point, right, where it's so cold and the moisture that's there is gonna freeze over, okay? It's gonna freeze, those droplets will freeze. Now, sometimes what'll happen is air is getting shoved up, okay? in the atmosphere. It's rising quickly, okay? Usually that happens before a storm. Usually that happens when there's a lot of drama going on between the cold and the warm. What that'll happen is that air kind of shoots up. Sometimes it falls back down, shoots back up, falls down before it hits the sky. And what you're doing is you're creating, you're adding little creases to that precipitation, to that ice, okay? You're adding a little more of a chunk quality to it until it becomes essentially stone-like, right? keeps going up and going down. Eventually, it weighs so much that gravity takes over and it falls down. I've seen hail the size of baseballs. It's crazy, okay? 
That's all because the air is rising up and rising down ahead of storms. Eventually it gets to the point where it just weighs too much and <laughs> goes down. Thanks very much for that question. All right, Donald, uh, why is Florida uh, always at 80 and 90 degrees all the time? Florida is uh, definitely <laughs> very hot, right? Well, you're, you're closer down to the equator. You're closer down to the, uh, the Tropic of Cancer, right? So that spot where really Maui or the warm, that, that's his headquarters. That's where he goes. You know, that's his spot. It's a source area. So sometimes he'll send some people to try to travel a little farther north, but this is his home. That's his headquarters, and that's where he hangs out. So that's an effect of latitude and being your proximity or closeness to the equator. Thanks for the question. Mesha Hall is sleet snow. No, no, it's not. It, it, it really kind of depends, again, if you climb a ladder and the temperature differences the higher that you go up on that ladder will create a different kind of precipitation, okay? Now, usually uh, you'll see a dendritic crystal. That'll be your snowflake, right? But instead, you know, that, that takes a little time to build up in the upper parts of the atmosphere. I instead, what'll happen is if that cold air is just a little bit above, the rain that falls will freeze over quickly into a sleet pellet. It really just kind of depends on the temperature profile in the atmosphere, okay? And where sometimes you're gonna have a spot here where it's very warm, cold, warm again. It changes. That entirely affects what kind of precipitation that you're gonna have. Who else we got? Kannapolis, what causes lightning and what causes thunder? Great question. Well, thunder comes from lightning, right? Thunder comes from lightning. So, uh, what causes lightning? How many have you ever gone on a carpet and you're walking like this with your feet kind of shuffling down like this? What you're doing is you're building a charge. You're building a charge. All of us have a charge. All of us have like an electrical component to us or a charge, okay? It's awesome. It's amazing, right? Well, we know by certain laws in nature that a positive charge would be drawn to a negative charge, right? And those opposite charges would cause lightning. So in a cloud, in a cloud, there's a charge. Isn't that cool? There's an electric charge. And so it's searching for an opposite charge. And if it finds one, it will go and create a lightning strike. The cool thing that you don't see, because again, can't always trust these guys. The cool thing you don't see and lightning is, it's actually also coming from the bottom of the ground. It's so fast you don't notice it. Yes, the lightning's coming in from the top, but there's also a little bit that comes. It calls the leader and then it's like that. That's really how lightning is. Can't see it, right? Can't trust it, unless you got a time lapse or something like that. And then, of course, the sound is the thunder. Hey, Melissa, what's going on? Thank you very much for your question, Melissa Taylor. Uh, no, no, it is not. Uh, uh, the, the tornado alley is more concentrated in the middle part of the United States, so you're a little too cold up where you're at. Thanks for the question. Uh, Meredith, how do you make it snow? Well, I don't make it snow. Snow is one of the most challenging things, as you uh, definitely know, in, uh, in Charlotte meteorology, and it, and it all really kind of depends on where cold air ends up. And a lot of times, cold will travel down as far as Charlotte and then stop and that drives us nuts. But that cold air is certainly, the position of that cold is critical. If you have cold air that is not just, like let's just say again, we think in, in the weather in three dimensions, right? So if you think about that cold air, uh, you know, it may be warm here, but just a little pocket of cold, and then a little bit warmer up top. Doesn't work you need a very deep layer of cold that goes all the way to the top of the atmosphere, and that's what will cause the snow. Believe it or not, guys, and it's another fancy word called the Bergeron process, but from all the clouds, it's snowing already. It's snowing already. But by the time that it hits the ground, it's rain because it's warm here, right? Right? So you need that cold to go all the way from the top of the cloud right to the ground. Got to have that. 
that's the way that you get snow. Again, folks, thanks very much for watching Facebook Live. We can stay on for a little bit longer, but I think there is a press conference that's coming up uh, that we won't we don't want to miss uh, that we will go to here momentarily. But let's get another question. Oh, my good friend Sally Anna Barton is watching. I'm actually uh, looking here at the questions while I'm talking to you guys, and uh, thank you. But you're watching. Uh, you're watching uh, Facebook Live, and I thank you very much for your questions. Uh, Chad Dry, why do we get snow if Atlanta gets snow? There's a lot of kind of cool things. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's just the way the climate works, you know. Uh, a lot of cool things that you can learn in a textbook, but there's some things that you can just learn from experience. And I've been here 14 years, and there is pretty much guaranteed that if it snows in Atlanta, it snows in Charlotte. It just moves right up by 85. Part of the reason is you have two things. You have the cold that came all the way down from the north, so you got that, and it's deep cold, but you also need what? Moisture, right? Well, down by Atlanta, you got plenty of it. It's called the Gulf of Mexico, right? You get those two, you got snow. Didn't happen this year. Didn't happen this year. Uh, Lacey, Jessica Barnes. Lacey wants to know, why does it rain a lot? We are in a very wet pattern, Lacey. Great question. And it's just, uh, can we go back to links one to answer that? We're, what we're noticing is our, our storm track, our storm patterns are just right on top of us. It's kind of right over the southeast. And why that's happening, it's certain measures of the climate. That, that, that certainly plays a role. What got that started in the first place? We don't know. But basically, our storm track has been extremely aggressive. And imagine the winds up top are very fast. Now, let's think about a NASCAR race. How, who doesn't love NASCAR? Can you imagine if cars are going at speeds of, where do they go, like 180 miles an hour? I think 200, right? You know what happens when just a little tap just a little tap causes big problems. Same thing here. Why can't the weather do the same thing? So if the air is going 150 miles an hour, and it's been doing that lately, all it takes is a little tap, causes big problems. Happens in NASCAR. Why can't it happen in meteorology? It does. That's what's happening right now. Thanks for the question. Christy Pritchard, why do tornadoes spin? Another fancy term we call the conservation of angular momentum. Yikes. Science stuff. Don't let it bother you, okay? Just think. Use your everyday experience to understand these concepts. How many, have you seen a spinning top before? How many of you, like when we get close to the Olympics, how many of you all seen the figure skaters, right? And the figure skaters start spinning, right? And they do the twirl. Pretty soon... They're twirling so much that they're not doing any extra work. Nature takes over. They're not doing anything, all right? They're just spinning around, right? Nature takes over. There's a property where if you start spinning around, it takes a life of its own. That's called the conservation of angular momentum. A tornado operates on the same principle. You keep spinning and spinning around, you're going. I'm sure you've probably done this where you put a bat on your head and you start walking around in circles. How many kids have done that? And then pretty soon you're spinning around, you're not really doing any extra effort. Same principle, same principle. Okay, how do we got, uh, Heather Kaufman, how does a cloud form? The air that you're breathing right now, it rises. All around us, it's rising. You get to a point, and remember, it's holding moisture too, right? It's holding moisture. So the air's climbing up above. Climbing and holding, holding, holding. Pretty soon, it gets to that point where it just can't hold that anymore, and the moisture spills over, and it causes cloud formation. It's pretty interesting, though. In reality, the bucket of water that you're carrying shrinks the farther that you go up, right? So that will cause and help that moisture to spill over and produce clouds and eventually rain. Stephanie Cartwright, where does that cold air form? Well, think about, remember, that the Earth is tilted. We talked about this earlier in the lesson, that the, air is that the Earth is tilted, okay? So there's going to be certain spots of the Earth that are not heated as much as the sun, because uh, they're not as close to the sun. Equator and the poles, right? So in the poles, you're a little farther away. But the thing is, that air doesn't stay there. 
it moves around. It moves around the planet. It moves around constantly. People always go, the weather always changes. If you don't like the weather now, wait until tomorrow. That's meteorology. That's what happens not just here in Charlotte, but all across the globe. It's 11.05. We have time for a few more questions before we uh, get ready to go to that press conference. Who do we got? Kareem Burgess. Uh, what causes hurricanes? That's his 11-year-old Noel. Thank you, Noel. Great question. Now, let's just imagine out here up in the ocean. I want you guys to think about, again, these are things that are happening in your everyday life. It just happens on a much bigger scale. How many of you ever try this safely with your parents? Um, boiling water. Boiling water. You heat up the water and it takes a while for that water to heat up, right? It takes a long time, but pretty soon it starts boiling and boiling and it gets really intense. Why can't that happen in nature? Why can't that happen in nature? So the sun is heating down the ocean, right? And it's beating down on the ocean and you're creating some serious heat and that is getting things going. And water is very interesting, the properties and the, just the miracle of water. Water doesn't all get hot right away, does it? It takes a little bit, right? Well, it still has energy, call it latent heat. Another big thing called latent heat. It's gonna use it for later, all right? It's storing it up. So that's why a hurricane, when it's ready to go, it's ready and it hits you hard. It's like it's going to the gym, right? And all of a sudden, you know, you're doing all your weights and everything else, and then it takes a little bit, right? But then all of a sudden you're real strong. That's what happens with a hurricane. It takes a little bit for that water to heat up, right? But once it's ready and it's boiling, it's cooking. It's cooking. Uh, Pamela, does fire affect uh, the weather? I mean, it can. It certainly can. You know, it can uh, inhibit uh, the, the what will happen is, you know, there's a lot of chemicals that come out of a fire and those are released into the atmosphere, sometimes unhealthily, sometimes healthily. Wildfires, as much as we don't like them, if they are induced, you know, as far as a conservation effort are very important. But those little particles can be like the building blocks of a cloud. There's little tiny nitrogen that is the building block of a cloud. Great question. Hey, Tristan Devine, nice to have you here with us. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Joy Henderson, here we go. How does the weather create and affect seasonal allergies? Thanks, Joy. <laughs> We're in that time, right? It's allergy time. You see the blooming out there. Well, let's keep in mind a, a couple factors. Number one, Charlotte. This is a cool thing about our city, the Piedmont. We live in one of the most heavily covered we, one of the highest tree canopies in the, in the entire country, Charlotte is. I think we're like, I think we're four, top four in the country of big cities. We have an amazing amount of trees. We love them. We do such a great job taking care of them, right? Well, those trees are, are you know, that pollination is uh, what gets your allergies going. Now let's think about all the rain that we've had and how much our plants and our trees are loving it, right? And you add heat into that, you're gonna have a big allergy problem. Our friends at the Allergy Center are gonna have a rough go. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, Gene Lewis, uh, volcano, volcanic eruptions. Uh, and why is it black? Well, you know, you're releasing so much, there's so much combustion and chemicals going into the air from a volcano. Um, and by the way, what you're seeing there is I'm scrolling uh, through the questions here. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, volcanoes, again, are necessary. They can provide the, that ash. Yes, there's pollution, but some of those particles will eventually lead to a cloud one day, which will eventually lead to rain, which is what we all need. It's 1110. Thanks so much for tuning in. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us here. And let me see if I can get some questions. Scroll up a little bit to see uh, if I've missed anything. Um, and again, you know, this is mainly we're doing this because, of course, the kids can't go to school and maybe they're not uh, having the opportunities to learn as much as they could in the classroom. This is something I do. I, I usually go to classrooms around uh, the Charlotte area around this time in the morning. Uh, so we're uh, doing this uh, right now. Uh, to uh, 
help you guys out. Uh, let's see, who else do we got here? Uh, question here, how do you make it snow? Uh, we answered that one. I don't make it snow, right? Um, okay, Monica, why, do, why is there more water in the air in the summertime? Great, 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 great question. Well, the thing is, you know, and again, what we do here, what we do as a meteorologist is, plain and simple, I describe the air. Can you imagine that? Take, for example, our weather clicker. How would you describe a weather clicker, right? It's got a gray color. It's kind of a square, rectangular shape. It's what I do with air. You can't see it, so I have to use other properties, right? Well, I know that there's temperature, right? There's warm air and there's cold air, so I'm doing that. Well, warm air can actually hold more moisture than cold air. Isn't that cool? So if you took a warm and a cold and stacked them up together, huh? And you, you, these guys are walking and they're carrying a bucket, right? Like, remember? Again, you got to use your imaginations here, guys. Got to do it. I don't care if you're 14 or 4. Keep your imagination. Air's carrying a bucket, okay? The warm guy, it's water, he's much stronger, he can handle a lot more than the cold guy. Cold guy can't handle a lot. That's like a, a lot of times in winter, you're, you, you know, you gotta have your chapstick, you know, you're, you're scratching, you know, you get dry skin, can't hold much water. The warm, that holds more water. And that's why in the summertime, you're going to get, uh, that more sweaty and you're going to get more moisture out there. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Elizabeth Ellis. Thank you very much. Uh, who else do we got here? Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for tuning in here. Uh, Jesse Elliott wants to know, what does thermodynamic mean? Guys, that's what we're, we're hopefully trying to, to teach you here today. Don't be scared by the big fancy words. Thermodynamics is pretty much what we talk about every day. All it is is the movement of air, okay? Air all around us moves and changes, sometimes bumps into each other. That's what causes your problems, okay? That's what causes weather drama. We got about five minutes left here, guys. We're gonna answer a couple more questions before we uh, let you guys uh, go. And we wanna thank everybody for tuning in. I wish I could get to everybody. Uh, you can certainly uh, try to hit me up on Facebook or something, and I'll try to get to you if you guys have any other uh, questions. Uh, let's see here, what do we have? Uh, will, will we have these daily, well, it's still a little too early to tell, we're kind of doing these things on a day-by-day -day basis, right? We're all having to do that, so we'll uh, see. What are the different colors on the map? Can we go back to uh, links two? Um, links two are basically, you're just measuring. We have cool satellites out there, guys, that can actually measure the, and put a plot out of the warmth and the cold that's around the country. There's all these satellites that we use, right? And we depend on those satellites to give us the information. So they provide us with this. We have a great thing here at Severe Weather Center 9, blessed with so much technology. We can track the air masses. We have, of course, live early warning Doppler 9 that we use, such as Charlotte's only local radar. So we're using those things to detect where those storms are. It's certainly a blessing that we have here at Severe Weather Center 9. I want to thank Tina Connolly for tuning in here. Uh, Monica Faust, what do you got here? Uh, yes, that, uh, we, we talk, Monica Faust talking about that heavier bucket of water in the summertime. Is that why we have those bigger storms? Yes, yes. A key ingredient to storms is that warm air, all right? If you have some intense warm air, it's going to rise fast and the higher that it goes the taller those clouds go has anybody ever heard of a cumulonimbus cloud kind of looks like an anvil that's a thunderstorm okay that is all caused by that warm air getting all kind of mixed up with the cold when these two duke it out that's when you start to see the air rising very rapidly the higher it gets the bigger potential for hailstones to form and if there's a little bit of wind in there, you're going to get a tornado as well. But that's also why you have some very, very heavy rain. Uh, let's see, Dana, let's see, uh, what do you, how long did it take to become a meteorologist? We go to college. Four years. That's all you got to do. But I tell you, you know, make sure you're able to not just be um, worried so much about those big words, okay? Be able to communicate too, guys, all right? 
be able to make sense for folks so they can understand, okay? Don't let those words fool you either, okay? Uh, let's see what we got here. How did I know I wanted to become a meteorologist? There are two things that I did. When I was little, there was a big tornado. A lot of people have a similar story. There was a big tornado where I'm at in Ohio, and I was trying to figure out why we're we being rushed down the stairs. What's going on here? And you just saw the power of nature. I'm amazed at the power of nature. And I'm also amazed about the power of what's going on on the earth. Our planet, friends, is such a tremendous resource. And what happens in it, yes, can be kind of chaotic, sometimes violent, but always a part of what it's doing. The earth knows what it's doing. And I tell you, take care of it, okay? All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and let you go and uh, get ready for a press conference here coming up in just a little bit. I thank you so much for your questions, and I hope everybody stays hopeful and positive during this tough time. We'll be back on Facebook Live with that press conference on WSOC in just a little bit.